We're introducing this song new to you today. I hope a lot of you have heard it on the radio, but I heard it for the first time about lunchtime on Friday, April 3rd. And that morning we had received word that Brent Glover, my nephew, Carlin Rick's son, had been diagnosed with a very ugly leukemia. And his wife, Courtney, posted this song on her page. And she said, I'm going to claim this. And when you hear the words to this song, look at the first verse. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. And the reality of that for me to think all the way back to when I was created in my mother's womb, not one day has caught God off guard, not one. And he plans that. And sometimes it doesn't feel good, does it? That doesn't feel like the goodness of God. And a diagnosis of leukemia or the death of a loved one or whatever your trial is, it doesn't always feel like the goodness of God. But the song goes on to say that His goodness runs after us. Which means a lot of times we step away from that and we say, this is not a good God and I want no part of it. But His goodness continues to chase after us. And so sing this song. Don't just sing it. Listen to the words of it and understand that His goodness is, even when it doesn't feel good, He is a good, good God. And we've watched that in our lives. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God
continue singing what a beautiful name it is. Now revealed 
most would say, Sila. Stop and think about that. We proclaim this morning what a powerful name the name of Jesus is. We know that. I know that. Because Clayton Houchins has been raised from death to life eternal. And Father, though we have a list of folks this morning who are in crisis, and are going through a journey and through a battle as Hope mentioned earlier, but we proclaim this morning with our mouths and with our hearts the goodness of God. So Father, would you hear these prayers this morning for Hannah Champion's Aunt Billy Tizza? The surgery went well. Perhaps though she had a stroke afterwards, would you keep her in your prayers? Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of my brother Richard Clawson who is here again this morning on crutches. Lord, he had plenty of reasons not to be here this morning. I pray, Father, that you would honor his faithfulness in his life and in the life of his family. Father, for Miss Billy Sheehan, for Vicki's mom, she's had pneumonia and COPD. And so she's being tested for the COVID virus. Father, we know that you can put a shield of protection around her. And we would ask you to do that, Father, that you would protect her from that virus and that you would raise her up and that we would proclaim your greatness and your power in her life. As our nephew Brent starts that next round, five more weeks, five days a week of cancer, of, of chemotherapy this week, would you help him, Father? Lord, would you be with him? Father, for Danae's father, Ron Gaddy, He's doing well after an overnight stay. Father, would you raise him up? Would you bring healing to his body? You made his heart. You can surely fix his heart. Father, for little Caden Lake with swelling in his face, they're trying to determine the root cause of that. Father, this morning, I don't know where Caden's at. Somebody put a hand on him. Hug him up real good. In Jesus' name, Father, we raise this young man up to you and we pray that you would give the doctors wisdom and bring healing to his life. We ask you, Father. Father, for Kathy Robinson, we've prayed for her for many weeks. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to help her as she continues this long, difficult battle in her life. Would you help Kathy Robinson, Father? Would you be there for her in our absence? Would you be a father and a husband to her, Father? For Jim Ryan, Lord, who thought he was through his treatment and found out this week he's going to have to go through radiation. He's not finished with that long journey yet. Father, would you carry him and hold him? Father, for Alan Thompson's father who is at home, we praise you for that as he begins physical therapy. Father, for Miss Verl Wall who has had a, a lump in her neck, appointment coming up later this month, Father, would you help her? Father, would, would you give again the doctor's great keen wisdom? Would you raise her up to health? Father, for our sister Jill, we've prayed for her and she had bad news and then good news and she's not out of the woods yet, Father. So we hold her up to you. Maybe she's watching this. I didn't see her. Maybe she's watching this morning. Father, we lift her up to you and ask you to hold her and to heal her. And then for Brian Parr, a, a gentleman in our, our, our community who perhaps even right now is undergoing a liver transplant. Wow, what a life-changing event that is. Lord, would you help him? As his father reached out to us and asked us as a church and perhaps many other churches to pray for, for Brian. Lord God, would you raise him up in our midst so that we can be careful to give you praise. 
Man, that seems like a long list of folks in crisis. Just in the next few seconds, if you got a name you want to call out, would you call it out right now? James. Amen. Joseph. Amen, amen, amen. Robin. Amen. Amen. My son's Caleb and Cohen. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we look around in our lives and proclaim with our mouths and our hearts that you are a good God, we are keenly aware of the reality that we are stuck in a sinful world. And in that sinful world, there is sickness and there is heartache and there is death. So Father, would you hear our prayers? Would you turn our mourning into dancing? Would you turn our death into life? Would you turn our impossible into your possible? And we will praise you for it. I didn't share any verses this morning. I'm just going to let them do it. You all will recognize these verses from Psalm 34. Father, we give these words to you and offer them as a praise from our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear and those who look upon him are radiant there'll never be a change Never be ashamed. This for mankind, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies. The Son of God surrounds His saints.
Say exactly that. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> but I was going to say if you're going to serve the Lord, just do it with all your heart. If you're going to run the soundboard, Greg, do it with all your heart. If you're going to grab a microphone and sing, just go ahead and open, let loose her and let her fly. Do it with all your heart. As into an audience of one. Right? It sounds great to us today in Brandon and Blair. I hope that it is in fact a sweet sounding smell, an incense in the sight of the Lord. If that doesn't get your fire lit, you're where the wood's wet. So now we're ready to go. We're in Matthew chapter 5 and today we come to the end of those easy little one-liners, those clever beatitudes that Jesus shared with us. Supreme blessings, the beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Number one, recognizing that I am empty-handed and poverty-stricken before the Lord. I have nothing to bring. I am poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are blessed for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The second beatitude, in mourning, I bring my tears before the Lord. And the Bible says in Revelation that He will wipe every tear from our eyes. He doesn't qualify that. Whatever it is, we just listed a bunch of prayer requests. Whatever that is, whatever that heartbreak is, whatever that mourning is, He says those that mourn are blessed because they will be comforted. Number three, in meekness, I recognize the power. This is Moses' staff. It used to be Moses' staff, and God turned it into the staff of God. The staff of God and gave Moses great power. In meekness, I recognize that my power is from the Lord, and I work to bring that power under control. Meekness or gentleness. It is not, woe is me, I'm a, I'm a worm, slap me if you want to. It is power. Gentleness, meekness is power under control. Beatitude blessing number four is the fork and the sippy cup. <laughs> Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I bring my biggie size fork and my adult sippy cup to the table only to find out that I don't need them. Because when I show up at the banquet table, go ahead, Roger. That's your cue. Ding. When I show up, nope, up, up, up right, up, down. There's nothing, man. Bird, no, up to the birds, please. Right there. I come before the Lord and I bring my fork in my sippy cup and I am hungry and I am thirsty for righteousness and I get to the banquet table and the Lord says, just go ahead and lay, lay, those, lay those down. You won't need them. I will fill you up. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they are blessed, for they will be filled. That's passive. I don't have to eat myself. They will be filled. It will be imputed to them. Then the next one, number five, it gets really hard. Blessed, those who show mercy are blessed, for they will receive mercy. Those who extend mercy to other folks, that mercy will be extended to them. When someone comes to me and they fail me or they hurt me or they offend me, and now I've got something against them because the scales are in my favor, Jesus says, hey what I would ask you to do would be to take that weight off the scales and remove it as far as the east is from the west, never to remember it again. Never to bring that up in conversation with your wife six months or five years or ten years or twenty years later as if it never happened. Clayton, do you want mercy to be extended to you? Extend that mercy to those around you. And then number six, my heart's desire is to be pure before the Lord. And He would say to me, just as the cup is beautiful and white and pure on the outside, and yet He would look and say, but is it dirty 
on the inside. Father, I desire for my heart to be as pure on the inside as it looks to be on the outside. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. I might have used to say, and then, and then last week is I'm, I'm growing because I'm moving from where I am to where God wants me to be. And being a peacemaker, these, these truths have caused me to stop stirring the, par, the pot. The peacemakers are blessed. And this was our picture last week. This wasn't hung up this week. It is hung up. It is hung up using a French cleat. You can ask Mike about a French cleat. But we saw that the cross is the picture of peace because there was a war between two parties and Jesus laid His life down and became the bridge that ensured my peace with God. I'm growing I'm moving from where God wants, where I am to where God wants me to be. These truths have helped me stop stirring the pot. I might have used to say, or I might have used to post my opinion, followed by, you can like it or not, I don't really care. I know I'm on, on, on uh, thin ice here. May I humbly submit to you that posting your political, moral, social, medical, racial, even religious views on social media, even if you are dead right, tossing those views into the social boxing ring, or boxing ring does not constitute being a peacemaker. That constitutes stirring the pot. It is frankly quite easy for me to throw the truth out there for people to either you can like it or you can choke on it. That is much easier than peace making. I humbly say to you that you won't be at risk of being called a child of God. <laughs> Remember, that's the promise to the peacemaker. The peacemakers are blessed for they will be identified as the children, the sons of God. Instead, peacemaking now gives me the courage to get into the middle of the boxing ring. I am, the, I am in the middle of the fight with the two warring parties. Whether those two warring parties might be the Republicans and the Democrats, or whether those two warring, warring parties might be the whites and the blacks, or between a man who is at enmity with his Heavenly Father, in the middle, I get into the ring in the middle of the battle with the goal of bringing about peace and stopping the war between the warring parties. Not as a spectator who is cheering on one side or the other. Not even as a referee who steps in to make sure that the fight is being fought fairly. But as a peacemaker, trying to reconcile the warring parties, trying to stop the fight. That's what a peacemaker does. And there I am in the middle of the ring between the two heavyweights, boxing it out. There I am in the middle of the process, trying to bring about peace, trying to do the right thing, and look what happens. I get slapped in the face. Or I might get punched in the jaw. It is in that context that Jesus would say, if you get slapped on one cheek, turn the other cheek because you are there to bring about peace before, between warring parties. It was not just slapped in the face that our peacemaker got. Our peacemaker got pinned to a tree to die so that he could bring peace between me, who is at war with my loving Heavenly Father. Peacemakers are blessed. So I get slapped in the face, or punched in the mouth, or mistreated. 
that for the, 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 the that for the, the righteousness for which I've been hungering and thirsting, I show up and I say, Lord, I want you to fill me up with, with righteousness. And here I go out and I'm righteousness, righteous and I get slapped in the face. <coughs> it might cost me my life. Remember that it cost Christ His life on the cross. <laughs> Some reward for doing what's right. Knowing that it's going to happen, anticipating the response of the folks out on the hillside that day, some reward for doing what's right. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for you'll be called the children of God. And then I go out and I make peace and I get slapped. Some reward for that. Anticipating that, Jesus gives us these final two blessings. The first one in verse 10 of Matthew chapter 5. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed. Man, that's not one of those blessings I really want in my life. I want to stand under the fountain of God's goodness. Those who are persecuted for this righteousness that I've, I've been hungering for. I came to the table and I was starved and you said put your, put your fork down and your sippy cup down and just stand there. Those who are hungry and thirst after righteousness are blessed. And I go and I hunger and I thirst after righteousness. And you fill me up and I am now righteous. And I go out and I get persecuted for it. I'm not certain that I even want that blessing significantly. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed for theirs is the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Do you remember back on blessing number one? The poor in spirit, those who can bear... This was Charles Spurgeon's picture of these Beatitudes. It was a ladder to heaven. The first step was, Father, this is all I got. Empty, I've barely got enough to come before Your holy presence except to step on the first rung of the ladder and say, Father, I'm, I'm empty-handed. I've got nothing. Can You do something with me? And he says, the poor in spirit are blessed for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Clayton, if you can just make it to the first step, and if you can just honestly admit you've got nothing to bring, then you on the ladder. And all you need to do is make it to the ladder. Because whoever's, whoever's on the ladder is part of the kingdom of heaven. That was that, remember that current blessing. Uh, the poor in spirit are blessed for theirs is current blessing. The rest of the blessings, number two through seven, always had that will be. It was future tense. The future tense, those who mourn will be comforted. Those who are a pure in heart will see God. Those who are peacemakers will be called the sons of God. Future blessings. But the first one, making it to the bottom rung of the ladder, theirs is right now the kingdom of heaven. And now just like bookends on this last one, those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed for the kingdom of heaven, just like the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs right now. It is a present blessing. It's as if you're now standing on the very top rung of the ladder. You started on the bottom rung recognizing I've got nothing to bring. And because you've got nothing to bring and you are empty, you ask God, fill me with righteousness. And He fills you with righteousness and you end up getting persecuted for that righteousness and He sticks you on the top rung of the ladder. The supreme blessing being on the top rung of the ladder is being persecuted for doing that which is right. You want to be on the top rung of the ladder in the kingdom of God? The ultimate of the supreme blessings is that you would be persecuted for righteousness. And then blessing number nine comes right behind it. A lot of folks combine these into two and say there's eight beatitudes, but Jesus used that word blessed nine times, so I combined them. Uh, I didn't combine them. I, I left them separate. We could call it uh, 8B. You remember that though, you remember who was sitting on the hillside? Tim? Thank you for being our religious leader. The frankly smug religious folks were there. I, again, I don't know if they were integrated into the crowd or if the religious folks sat here and the common folks sat over here, but it's very clear that they were there. The frankly smug religious folks, by now probably with their arms crossed like Tim has, maybe their head stuck up just a little bit in the air, 
shaking their heads at this day at this country carpenter self-made preacher and those simple simpletons those common folks who were in fact hungering and thirsting after righteousness that's the two groups that were there that day the text doesn't say it but I'm certain that as Jesus came to this last blessing and talked to these folks over here, I'm certain that His hand pointed right over there. As He came to the last blessing, number nine, you common folks, you common folks are blessed when they insult you. And and when they persecute you, and when they falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Jesus was predicting it. He knew it was coming. You get filled up with righteousness, and you're going to get, number one, insulted, and number two, persecuted. The Holman Christian Standard tells us Jesus' words show us that persecution is typically either verbal insult or violent, persecuted. The word persecute includes acts of physical violence, like a slap of the face. And so our final picture of the supreme blessing in the life of the Christian, frankly, is the whip or the belt. I don't have a whip, so I brought a belt. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not to be too melodramatic, but this is the picture of the Roman scourge. You've heard it called the cat of nine tails. On each of those nine tails, often there were pieces of bone or steel. And you can imagine the victim tied against a post, and there was the slap. I had this practiced. practicing for my sermon tomorrow. You can imagine the sound of the whip as the bone and the steel ripped into the victim's back. Go back up please, Roger. You are, you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you. And falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Then verse 12, <laughs> be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. For those who lived before you, what an unfair reward for being righteous. He doesn't say it, but he's thinking they're going to persecute you just like in a few months they're going to persecute me. Let me be prophetic for just a minute. The demise of the nation of, the, of Israel in the Old Testament was because of failed spiritual leadership. Tim, brother high priest Tim, the demise of the nation of Israel was because the religious leadership failed. The prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, you can go read them. These prophets stood up and said, if you don't, if you don't turn back to the Lord, if you don't repent of your idolatry, if you don't repent of your self-righteousness, God is going to judge you. And the religious leaders persecuted these prophets some even to death for righteousness sake. And God finally said, you, you remember, God finally said, I'm done. Enough. Israel, I'm going to allow you to go off into captivity to Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia because you have failed to turn back to me. It would call that, that passage of Scripture that we quote, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my not the bad people out there doing the bad stuff out there that we often throw rocks at. Those stupid people, if they'd stop their stupid stuff, the world knows. My people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Then I'll hear from heaven. 
I'll forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And I would say to you that that verse of Scripture applies to the United States of America today. My prophetic word is this, the only real threat to the freedom of America is that truth. Supremely blessed are the folks who take a stand with gentleness and humility. Willing to be a peacemaker and take it on the chin if that's what it, call, if that's what it calls for. Supremely blessed are those folks. Not what's happening in the government. Not what even is even happening outside the doors in our culture. But what is happening within my own heart. With your own heart, Brother Religious Tim. You've been doing this thing a long time, haven't you? It is your heart, it is my heart that He is looking to. Choosing to do what's right, if you do that, plenty of persecution will come your way. And here's what it will sound like. You narrow-minded Bible thumpers. Always so self-righteous. Always think you're right. You always think you have the only answers, like you've got a corner on the truth. Like your God is somehow more powerful than all the other gods. You're a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites. Like you don't ever do anything wrong. You need to get out of the 13th century. Things have changed now in the 2000s. People are different. Morals are different. Life is different. You all talk about love and tolerance. But then you hold on to these archaic moral values. You need to be more accepting. You need to be more tolerant. You need to let people be free to make their own decisions without imposing your own moral values. It's kind of the insult part of what Jesus said is going to come against us. You know what? Whenever I hunger and thirst after righteousness, I hunger for it. God, would you help me be righteous? And I open my mouth and He fills me up. Do you know what? I'm not who I should be. But I'm not the man I used to be either. God's doing work in my life. He is doing work. Israel, I'm, I know I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm not who I used to be. God is at work and He is doing a work in my life. I don't mean to be self-righteous. I don't want to be self-righteous. I don't want to be intolerant. I just, God has just done a great work in my life and my desire is to get in the middle of the ring with you and help you move to the same place that He's taken me. It's our mission. Helping people move from where they are to where God wants them to be. Starting. Starting. Starting right here with me. No, I don't mean to be self-righteous. Yes, I believe that the truths of God's Word, we've got to stand on them. But I'm not condemning you. I'm in the middle of the boxing ring. I am fighting with you. And I am fighting for you so that the war between you and a loving Father can come to an end and you will know the peace of God. That's right. That's the insult part. The persecution part, the second part of that may not be as pronounced yet in America as the insult part. But in other parts of the world, being a Christian, a righteous Christian, might cost you your job or your business or your buying power or your hiring power. It may very well even cost you your life. But the promise, <laughs> the reward, is great in heaven. Special supreme blessings for those who get persecuted for doing what's right. That's the top ladder. The top rung on the ladder of the kingdom of heaven. For those who are willing even eager to pay the price. That wasn't a new reality. It happened to the prophets of old. It would happen to these folks on the hillside. And it would soon happen to Jesus. But it didn't stop with Jesus. They thought if they could get rid of Jesus, they would end the movement. It didn't stop with Jesus. In fact, that was really the start of it. Do you remember that Paul himself, he was on the persecuting side of the equation. He was the great persecutor. He was even responsible for killing Christians. The ultimate persecutor. But then he's going down the road and Jesus said, I'm going to save that wretched murder sinner, Israel, tender, I mean, uh, Saul. I'm going, to, I'm going to spin him on a dime. 
And Saul became Paul. He became a Christian. And now he found himself on the other side of the equation. And he spent his life getting persecuted while he had formerly been the persecutor. Throughout his ministry, Paul continues to do battle with these cotton-picking religious leaders. By the way, you see, uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a startling one for me, there is a distinction between being religious and being righteous. Those two are not the same thing. Paul is now doing battle with the religious leadership. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he, he's battling with them. He's saying, are they Hebrews? Are they Jews? Me too. Are they Israelites? Me too. So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? He didn't answer that. I'm talking like a madman. I'm talking out of my head. I probably shouldn't be saying this. I might be setting myself up, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm a better one than they are. Do they say they're servants of Christ? I'm a better one than they are. You, you want some proof? Well, let's just get some proof. I've had far more labors, many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, near death many times. Five times I received the 39 lashes. It called for 40, but the religious folks didn't want to do 40 in case they miscounted because they'd be in trouble. So they only gave him 35 times. We only had that one time recorded for us in the book of Acts, you may remember. Five, uh, five times I received 39 lashes from those religious folks. Three times I was beaten with rods by the Romans. Once I was stoned by my enemies. That was back in the town of Lystra. You may remember that from our map. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. Going to 26. On frequent journeys, I've faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the open country, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. Verse 27, labor and hardship, many sleepless nights, sometimes hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and lacking clothing. You want to say, hey, Brother Paul, at some point you probably need to hang up your cleats and retire. Goodness gracious, man, you sure went above and beyond, didn't you? In this being persecuted for righteousness' sake, and Paul would say, no, nah, I'm just stop, stop piling my blessings. The reward will surely outweigh the cost. And then Paul shucks it to the cob for us. May I share this passage with you and say to you that if you have lost your purpose in life and you are looking for a goal, consider these words from the Apostle Paul. He had just given his resume about all of the things he had done in his life and all of the things that he had accomplished and how righteous he was before he became a Christian and how he was the religious leadership and then he became a Christian almost as if this supreme blessing rang through his head. He said these words, but everything that was a gain to me, I've considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Are you looking for a value in your life? Something you can bank on, something you can hold on to, something you can believe in. How about the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus your Lord? Because of Him on planet earth, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them filth or dung or waste so that I might gain Christ. Ready? And be found in Him on this ladder to heaven. Be found in Him not having, my, uh, uh, not having a righteousness of my own from the law. That's what I did before. But I gave it up and said I've got nothing. Not having a righteousness from the law, but instead having one that is through Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. And then verse 10, you're looking for a goal in your life? Here it is. My goal is to be a wonderful pastor. My goal is to reach 46,500 people. 
My goal is to never sin again. My goal is to make sure that you never sin again. Paul says, no. My, my goal is to run a business or get a, this job or this education or this whatever. Paul says, my goal is to know Him. And the power of His resurrection because Clayton used to be a dead man in his sin and now, look, boom, he has been raised to walk. I'm telling you, that's some power right there. My goal is to know Him and the power of His resurrection and here's the part, and the fellowship of his suffering. If it was good enough for my Lord Jesus to do, I want a fellowship in that. I want a part in that. If, if it was good enough for him to suffer for righteousness, it's good enough for me to suffer for righteousness. I want to know him and his great resurrection from the dead power and the fellowship of his sufferings even if it causes me to be conformed to death. Tradition tells us that Paul in Rome was executed because he was a Christian. It took his very life. For Paul, it was a, a litmus test. It's hard to hear these supreme blessings don't always like, look like we want them to look here in middle class Boiling Springs, America. Things are happy and safe over in North River, River Hill Subdivision. Sterling Estates is a nice, safe, comfortable, comfortable place to live, isn't it? Rick Warren reminds us that Jesus' call to his disciples was one, hey guys, come and see. Come and follow me. Come and see. Come and see and taste that the Lord is good. Come and experience his supreme blessings. Come and drink from the fountain of His grace and His favor and His righteousness. Come on! Come and see. That's the first part of His call. Come and see. And then He says, Go and die. Die to yourself. Take up your cross. Open-handed on planet earth with nothing to bring with you except the righteousness with which Jesus filled you up with. And finally, as the ultimate supreme blessing, willing to be persecuted because of that great righteousness. Looking ahead to the end, that's what's happening in heaven. John tells us, he says, those people who were persecuted and died, they did not love their lives in the face of death. Wow. Willing to give it up. I want to close with the words of that old hymn. I started to play it. We couldn't find a version we like. It's an old hymn. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No. There's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. The final supreme blessing, those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed for theirs is right now the kingdom of heaven. I imagine over these past weeks as we've considered these nine little easy one-liners that you perhaps find yourself in one of these two camps. Clayton, first, these supreme blessings are too much. In fact, transparently, if I could be honest, I'm saying, is the payoff really worth the pain? Is the reward really worth the risk? To you, I would say, if you're not there yet, if you're not at a place where you'd stand up and say, I'm willing to give my life for Jesus Christ, do you know what I would say to you? Just come on a little closer. Come and see. Taste a little more and see that the Lord is good. Watch and see if the Lord does that supernatural, crazy, amazing, awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping work in your life that causes you to say, ah, that's the one living God. That's the God I love. That's the God I serve. Now maybe I'm ready and willing to give my life for Him. If you're not there yet, I just say to you, come and see. Scoot in a little closer. Lean in a little more. Take another taste and see if in fact the Lord is good. Second, you might be saying, you know what? I want my life to count for Christ. I, I've been challenged by these truths that are backwards. If I want to be receive mercy, I gotta give mercy. I gotta check and make sure my heart is as impure on the inside as the outside looks. But honestly I'm a little overwhelmed. 
I don't I can't do it. Where do you start? To you I would say start step one, empty hand. God, I've got nothing. I've got I've got nothing. I've been I've been doing this thing for fifty years. I should have it figured out now, but I ain't got it figured out. I've got nothing. And then step four, Father, would you fill me up with your righteousness? Would you impute that righteousness to me? Can I just say to you that if you'll do those two things, you'll have plenty of opportunities to be merciful. <laughs> because there'll be plenty of people who offend you and give you the opportunity instead of responding like we used to respond, to respond and say, it's okay, I forgive you. You'll have opportunities to be merciful. You'll have opportunities to be peacemakers. He will work to purify your heart. If you'll answer that call, God, I want to serve you. If you'll answer that call that Isaiah heard and to which he responded, Lord, here am I. Send me. Will you pray with me? Father, they sound so easy and they're kind of easy to memorize. But Father, I come to you this morning once again at the foot of the ladder to the kingdom of heaven. Empty-handed, I've got nothing to bring but my unrighteousness. Recognizing that I mess it up a whole lot more than I get it right. I'm asking you, Father, can you do something with Clayton Houchins? Can you make me a fit vessel for your kingdom? Lord, maybe I'm not ready yet. I'd like to get a little closer and see a little better and taste a little more. For the person here today, Father, who is not yet at peace with you, would you draw them close to you with your arms of love and help them? Father, thank you for speaking to Clayton Houchin's heart this week and this morning and these weeks through the truth of your word. It's hard to say, Father. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. I'm not sure I'm prepared for the journey. But Father, I would ask you that you would rain down on me your supreme blessings, whatever it looks like. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be right here. Greg's going to play the, the music. I don't know where God has spoken to you over these weeks or this morning. Go ahead, Greg. Man, what an incredible song. Jesus. Jesus paid it all. I can show up with empty hands and stand before Him and let Him work in my life because He's already done all the work. I hear the Savior say that strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray and find that me not all in all. Jesus paid all your past, all your regret, all your shame, all of your, all that, all that stuff, that dysfunction. Jesus paid the price for that. Come, come and see. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. So I'll just tell you that next Sunday, I don't know how the, the Beatitudes might have 
touched or challenged you, there's going to be a young lady who's going to come. I've asked her to come. Uh, that is a friend of my sister's, and she's going to share a testimony about the impact of the Beatitudes on her life. She heard through my sister that our church was talking about the Beatitudes, and she set off on a journey of her own, and we're going to hear, hear that journey next Sunday. So that will be the end. I don't know if I'll show my, have my little show and tell up here or not, but that'll be next Sunday. I love you, and I'm praying for you that God will bless your life and satisfy you with good things. And, bless you a hundredfold and jaw drop you into an all inspiring work in your life. Father, would you release us with your great blessing and with your presence. Father, we don't want to be content with status quo. We ask, Father, this week that we would see your great power, maybe even your resurrection power. Would you drop our jaws and would you draw us close, Father, into your presence? Would you turn our attention from the things that grab our attention here on earth? Would you grab our attention and turn us into the light of your wonderful face? Release us, Father, with your blessing. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.